There's my exercise for the week. <laughs> well, I hope I get a little more than that. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. Now, this morning it was announced that the message tonight was supposed to be, uh, when I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. But that's actually coming up. Uh, sadly, our secretary was one week ahead in typing bulletins, and so we had the wrong message for this morning written in the bulletin and the same for this evening. Tonight, it's resumes and revolution, but we did not quite finish the message on Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. And so we'll look at part three of Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder, and hopefully get through part one of resumes and revolution. We're in the book of Acts. Tonight, the new portion will be Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 23. But I'm going to begin by looking at Acts uh, chapter 21, verses 26 through 40, to try to finish up the material that we did not quite finish on December 13th. You remember December 13th is when we looked at the second part of uh, Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. And then the 20th was the Christmas candlelight service. And then the 27th was guest speaker Keith McCoy while I was down in Alabama. And so tonight we're back to finishing up Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder, part three, and beginning res resumes and revolution. Uh, and we added something last time. We added a little section because it was in the text. Funny how you have to do that kind of thing. You can't skip things. We talked about the keys to the weaker brother issue. People, this is a very important topic because the weaker brother issue has caused incredible division in the body of Christ throughout the centuries. Sometimes it's because stronger believers do not take into consideration the weaker brothers, and sometimes it's because the weaker brothers use their so-called weakness to manipulate the church. And so things pull back and forth and back and forth, and churches are divided, and the devil has a, a heyday because he knows he can use the weaker brother issue to destroy churches. So it's very important for us to understand what that is all about. We talked about four general areas that need to be dealt with. I'll go through them very quickly. Number one, spiritually weaker brothers are real brothers. But the scripture makes it clear that they should not be included in questionable discussions and issues where the scripture may not be clear and where leadership may still be working out the practical application of various lifestyle principles, how it applies to current issues in the particular society in which that group of believers happens to live. They definitely should not be consulted in setting church policy or in determining church activities or writing church doctrinal statements or other things where their weakness will affect others. And Paul explains that in Romans 14, 1, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Number two, the second point that we studied in somewhat of detail, stronger Christians should be willing to give up their so-called rights as needed for the sake of weaker brothers so as not to hurt their spiritual growth. We saw that there are two parts to that particular point. Number one, the failure of strong Christians to show deference to weak Christians is a manifestation of pride, selfishness, and ultimately destroys weaker brothers. And number two, the weaker brother is not defined as the one who loudly objects to what you do. Many people claim to be the weaker brothers, and they're the ones that are running around screaming and yelling, pounding on, you know, trees with axes and, you know, cutting big side of the church, you know, big signs and things like that. That's not the weaker brother. The weaker brother is the one who follows your example. He's the one who does what you do as a matter of your Christian liberty, but he has a weak conscience, and when he does the same thing, it wounds his conscience. His conscience tells him it's wrong. It may be okay for you as a matter of your Christian liberty, but, but because of the background from which he comes, you are, in fact, destroying him. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Third, the stronger brother is not necessarily the one who holds to the strictest interpretation of the law. In other words, somebody who holds to the letter of the law. Many who think themselves as stronger brothers are in fact the worst examples of Christian maturity because they violate scriptures in ways that they fail to realize. That then sets the example for the destruction of the weaker brothers. So just because somebody is a legalist, he follows the letter of the law and misses the spirit of the law, he may in fact be destroying weaker brothers in that same way. Paul discusses that in Romans chapter 2. 
The fourth area that we looked at in some detail is being a weaker brother. And we need to understand this. If you claim to be a weaker brother, it tells something about you. Being a weaker brother means that you are carnal and not spiritual. Paul wants us to grow up. God wants us to grow up. We're his children. He wants us to get out of the baby state where we wet our diapers and throw temper tantrums and spit up our food. Being a weaker brother means that you are carnal and not spiritual. Weaker brothers need to grow up. We expect babies to be weak, so we show them deference. We treat them gently. We restrict our own rights for their care. We give up things so that they will mature properly. But we expect them ultimately to grow up. They are not supposed to continue in a state of spiritual infancy. Unfortunately, there are too many weaker brothers who have learned to manipulate other Christians by insisting on remaining in a state of spiritual infancy or acting like they were still babies needing special care. And you know people like that. They're the ones that pout and fuss and whine and cry if you don't do the thing their way, the way they want it done, the way they want it done now, you know. And you're hurting me if you do it this other way. Dear people, time to grow up. Time to grow up. That's what introduced us to the Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and murder. We learned a number of very important lessons from that passage in uh, chapter 21. Sometimes when you do the right thing, you get into trouble. <laughs> Paul was doing the right thing. It's what got him into trouble. Nevertheless, we always must do the revealed will of God. As you often hear me say, do right and leave the results to God. The devil's crowd will always try to slander you, lie about you, trip you up, attack you, mess up your life, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter in the long run. Who cares what they say? Who cares what they do? If they kill you, you go to heaven anyway. If they persecute you for the sake of Christ, you get heavenly rewards. So who cares what they say? That's a hard one to learn. It used to bother me an awful lot that I got criticized all the way through high school, all the way through college. They uh, uh, called me many different names uh, in high school and college. In high school, they called me H.G. Spencer, which stood for Holy Ghost Spencer. <laughs> and in college, they called me the Nabi, which is a very poorly pronounced Navi, which is the prophet. Uh, and by that, they meant the false prophet. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. As my mother used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we learn that, we can move forward and not have to worry about what other people think, what other people say. What counts is what does God say about the way in which we are responding, the way in which we are acting in the culture and society in which he has placed us for his glory, for our good, for the testimony of Jesus Christ, for the conviction of the sins of sinners, for the edification of those who are believers, and for the spiritual growth of the weaker brothers. If you're a spiritual brother, your desire is to see others grow. Peter tells us that we should expect persecution to come. First Peter chapter 4. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why is this happening to me? I've heard so many Christians say that kind of a thing. But, but I've been serving the Lord. Why is this happening to me? Oh, well, because God said it would if you lived for Christ. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But Paul says that doesn't mean all suffering. Because sometimes you're suffering for being stupid. For example, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. A lot more people need to suffer for being a busybody in other men's matters. It would stop a lot of busybodiness. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God 
Did you know nothing happens outside of the will of God? Nothing. Nothing. It's all designed for our good and his glory. We're still accountable for our sins. But God uses even that to teach us lessons so that we won't do it again. Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. It transforms your life. Suffering is designed to purify, to burn out all the dross and the dredges that are in your life. Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. It changes your life when you go through it. The second lesson that we learned was you may, in fact, be in the process of setting a godly example for others to follow. And that's what happened in the case of the Apostle Paul. He was leading a group of men who were completing their vows and uh, doing what was required of them. They'd made a vow, and if you don't fulfill your vow, you know, you got a problem. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 tells you God will destroy the work of your hands. You make a vow, you don't keep your vow. God says, okay, you're just like a fool. I'll destroy the work of your hands. God expects us, when we make a promise, when we make a vow, to keep it and to keep it exactly like God said to keep it. Paul was doing that. So were these other men. That's what we as mature Christians are supposed to do. We keep our word. The example is critical. We talked about the Old Testament prophets who set the example even though they suffered for it in James 5. We talked about Jesus setting the example even though he suffered for it in John 13 and 1 Peter 2. For in here and two were you called, because Christ also has suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. We saw Paul set the example, even though he suffered for it. Philippians 3.17, brethren, be followers together with me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. We saw that Paul exhorts Timothy to set an example, regardless of the consequences. Let no man despise thy youth, 1 Timothy 4.12. But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. There are consequences for setting a bad example. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That brought us to the third lesson, which was you will never be any place where somebody doesn't know who you are. Oh, I have seen that so many times in my life. I cannot go any place if somebody doesn't know me. You know, I was on my way down to Barry Judy, and we were driving, and we stopped at some obscure location for breakfast in Virginia, and I was sitting and talking to some of my children who were traveling with me at that point, and um, a man walked over to me who I vaguely recognized, and he said, is that the voice of Christian Spencer? And I looked up, and it was Paul Elliott. He's written some of the books that you've seen back there on the back tables. And I thought, I can't believe it. Here I am eating breakfast in a hotel restaurant in the middle of no place, Virginia, and a man walks up who recognizes my voice. And I said, thank you, Lord, for reminding me that no matter where I go, you always have someone there who knows who I am. I have a testimony to bear, a witness to carry, so do you. And he had seen me from the back but heard my voice and recognized my voice. Every place you go, somebody knows you. God is watching and God makes sure that there are witnesses in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Just remember, that's a very important principle. The Apostle Paul saw it here. When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, they had walked a long way. When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. <laughs> Didn't matter where he was. Somebody was going to recognize him. God's always watching. He always has witnesses be able to testify against us. We gave you lots of references. Genesis 16, Matthew 18, 2 Corinthians 13, 1 Timothy 5, Hebrews chapter 10. Lesson 4. There's always somebody who doesn't like what you're doing. Don't try to please the crowd. All it'll do is get you into trouble. There's always going to be somebody who doesn't like what you're doing. Make sure you're doing what God wants you to do. Because there will be somebody who doesn't like what you're doing, no matter what you're doing. Just make sure that you're in the center of God's will. We're surrounded by critical people. Oh, 
totally surrounded, who are not weaker brothers, who would not be tempted to do what they are criticizing you for doing. We saw about that over in 1 Peter chapter 3. In fact, there's eight verses dealing with that. Lesson number five was if you're doing right, that will force your accusers to mix the truth with lies. You know, uh, remember, remember the source of all lies is Satan himself. And when people have to lie about you to get you into trouble, you must be doing what is right. Because if they had something really to accuse you of doing, they wouldn't have to resort to lies. But people will lie about you. Just count on it. And we looked at uh, John 8, 42 through 44 on that. Lesson number six, their accusations will often be based on inference, suppositions, and half-truths. Acts 21, 29, we said, So for they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed. There's the supposition. There's the, they're, they're basing it on something else they saw, not what they see right then, that Paul had brought into the temple. When people falsely accuse you, it's often because they're reflecting on their own character. I discovered that a long time ago. I think, you hypocrite, you're accusing me of that? That's what you're known for. People will often accuse you because they're reflecting on their own character. Something that they themselves would do if they found themselves in a similar situation. We always think other people have the same pet sins that we have and we expect them to respond in the same sinful ways in which we respond. That's the basis for most carnal secular advertising. We've talked about advertising a great deal in the past. We'll not cover that again here. Although they don't call it that, advertisers have learned to manipulate the old sin nature and the seven deadly sins, which they know lie in the heart of every man, woman, and child. But the strongest antidote that we learn for that, of having accusations that are falsely thrown against you, is having a clear conscience. 1 Peter 3.16 having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And it is possible, oh dear people, to learn this lesson. I struggled with this in my early teen years until I learned this lesson out of the book of Hebrews, out of Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Instead of letting the devil grab hold of your conscience, those big handles on the side of your conscience, and shaking you and rattling you to your core and saying, look, don't you remember when you did such and such, or when you said such and such, or when you thought such and such, or the bad motives that you had, or the awful attitudes that you had? Don't you remember that? How can you serve Jesus with that in your past? The blood of Christ not only cleanses you from sin, it cleanses your conscience from dead works. And why? to serve the living God. God wants your service. And so he's going to do what's necessary through the blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross so that you can continue to serve and the devil can't rattle your cage. Bring up those painful things in your conscience. Throwing you back into the past instead of focusing on the future. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds. Jesus cleanses your conscience by his blood. Lesson number seven. And that was the last thing that we covered, was this lesson number seven. The mindless masses always respond with knee-jerk reactions to wild and reckless accusations. In fact, the worse the accusations the crazier the response. People always believe a lie. You know, have you noticed that? You know, if you're telling them something sober and, you know, in fact, it might even be interesting, they're not interested in listening unless it's really, really bad. Do you understand that's what makes the news the news? How many times on the evening news do you find them discussing the number of people who had wonderful doctor's appointments that day. <laughs> you don't. How many times do you find them on the news discussing how many people were courteous to one another 
by opening the door at the grocery store for some little old lady. You don't find stuff like that. Why? Because that doesn't sell the news. The good stuff doesn't sell. It's how many people were killed in this terrorist attack. How many people got raped by the serial rapist? You know, what just happened down in uh, Washington, D.C. that puts a politician into the jug? You know, that's what makes news. And the wilder the accusation, the more interested the people are in it. You know, uh, a terrorist tries to make an attack. Well, that'll make it maybe once or twice under the news. But, but something like the shooting out in California, that was on the, on the news for days and days and days. They were tracking the guy down. and Everybody wanted to know whether or not he'd been caught or the two of them, who were they connected to. You know, dear people, the wilder the accusations against you, the more excited people will be for the gossip that goes along with it. You know, we often have a carnal response to that. We get bitter. We get angry, we get resentful. But when you do that, it only hurts you. Being bitter and resentful, I gave you this quote three weeks ago, being bitter and resentful is like drinking poison and hoping that the other guy will die. <laughs> you only hurt yourself. And that's what brings us to tonight as we look at the last part of this passage here in Acts chapter 21, verses 26 through 28 brings us to lesson number eight. Here's the Apostle Paul. He gets grabbed. They're trying to kill him. They're going about to beat him up and kill him. It says, as they went about to kill him, tidings came out of the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And all Paul was doing was walked into the temple with some guys to fulfill a vow, and the whole city went into a panic. Doesn't seem like a very big trigger for the big explosion that they got, does it? And immediately... He took soldiers and centurions and ran down under them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. <laughs> In other words, nobody had the foggiest idea. They just knew that there was a big rag going on. And do you remember some of the riots that they've had in different cities? Oh, back in the 60s, where people were hey, there's a riot going on. It's a good opportunity to break some store windows. And hey, there's some stuff in the store windows that we'd like. Let's go ahead and break the store windows and grab stuff while we're getting as good. And after all, it's a riot. Nobody can point the finger at us. Everybody was doing it. This was going on here. Some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. When they could not know for certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. The violence of the people for walking in, fulfilling a vow, and giving a sacrifice. When you get down to the bare facts, it often has no relationship to what the results have been. And so he asked the captain if he can speak to the people on the stairs and so on. Which brings us to the eighth lesson. When authority responds properly to public panic, order is restored, lives and property are protected, and the law is upheld. We need to remember that God is the one who ordained government. Too often we uh, have the libertarian view that we ought to get government out of everything and the uh, need to get rid of government entirely. And I know that government can be too big. And yes, government can be oppressive. And you can have a communist government. You can have a Nazi government. You can have all kinds of pagan governments. You can have all kinds of horrible things happening. But God ordained government, and he gave government certain responsibilities. And we are in subjection to government. Rome was a very wicked government. And yet Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 13 about obedience to the government. Because God is the one who ordained it. God established government in Genesis chapter 9. All the way back to the beginning chapters of the book of Genesis. That's in the first 20% of the book of Genesis. God ordained it. God established a human government for an entire nation. When he brought Israel out of Egypt and gave them the law at Mount Sinai, he gave them a national government. God has placed into the hearts of men what is necessary for good government? Paul says so in his sermon over in Acts chapter 17. And he tells us theologically why that is in Romans chapter 13. When authority responds properly to public panic, order is restored, lives and property are protected, and laws upheld. 
So the captain rescues Paul. Now, you know, Peter explains several other reasons in this type of a context. You know, you've heard the old saying, actions speak louder than words. It's usually quoted to keep you from being a hypocrite. But Peter puts it in a little different light in the context of sin and suffering. Your actions will speak louder than their words. That's what's going on with Paul here. Your actions will speak louder than their words. It's that context in which he counsels us concerning civil rulers. 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation, that's the word for your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Your actions are going to be seen, and your action will speak louder than their words. Look, this is in the context of civil government, because the very next verse says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Verse 15. People say, oh, if I only knew the will of God. Oh, I want to know the will of God. If I knew the will of God, I would do the will of God. Well, you know, the Bible talks a lot about the will of God. For example, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Well, right off the bat, you know the will of God is avoid sex sins. But here's the will of God on another issue. Verse 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Well-doing in the context is submitting yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or as unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and the last thing in that list, honor the king. Dear people, how often have you, I don't know about you, but I certainly have been tempted not to honor the one who is at the top of our chain of command. Sometimes I just groan in my spirit when I see what's happening. But the Bible commands me to honor him. Peter's commanding us to honor the king in the context of weird Roman emperors. When we function in that way, and Peter explains it, we just read it. When we function in that way, we destroy the anti-Christian arguments of the God-haters. There's so many out there right now that want to destroy Christianity. You see it all over the place. All the types of things that they are passing in terms of legislation, all the rulings of the courts, not all, but a good number of the rulings of the courts, those are all things that are designed to try to show their hatred for God. Respect for others, love of other believers, the highest proof, by the way, of our love for God. We'll see that in a few minutes. Giving deserved honor to our civil rulers. You know, it's the proof of our love for God when we love each other. Yes, loving other Christians. That silences the opposition. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. He doesn't just say love one another. He sets the standard personally. How many of you love one another in the same way that Jesus loves you? You know, I always make that point at wedding ceremonies that I perform. You know, the, the wife has a very simple responsibility to obey her husband and to submit to him. You can do that mechanically. But the husband has the infinitely more difficult role because he must love his wife as Christ loves the church. I remember one of my seminary professors talking about uh, a young seminary student coming in and saying, you know, uh, 
I'm, I'm really having a hard time with my marriage. And he says, I came home to go to bed with my wife the other night, and I went in, and there was a rose on the pillow, and she wasn't there. So what am I going to do? Well, uh, the professor said to him, well, do you love her very much? He said, yes. He said, do you love her as much as Jesus loves the church? Oh, nobody could love that. He says, well, that's what the Bible commands you to do. You better get with it. To love your wife as Christ loves the church. Did you know Jesus said that we're supposed to love one another the same way? A new commandment I give unto you. This is Jesus speaking. That you love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. If we had that kind of love in a marriage, the marriage would never break. If we have that kind of love in the body of Christ, in the church, the church would never split. And Jesus tells us something else. If you have that kind of a love, that's a proof of something. Verse 35, by this, that is your love one for another, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Not general love. He just told you. He defined it for you. The love that he has for us. Those are serious issues. The Apostle Paul exemplified that. And as Peter says, when you demonstrate this kind of thing, it's proof of the person to whom you belong, Jesus Christ. Our proof of our love for God by loving each other silences the opposition. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 13 and following, John writes, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life. I mean, there's no question about that. And how do we know it? How do you know? You say, well, I got the right theology. Well, that's one of the three tests in, the gospel, in, the, in 1 John. There are three tests to prove whether or not you're a Christian. In 1 John. First of all, you have to have true doctrine concerning the person and work of Christ. The doctrine of Christ, John calls it. And um, the second test that he gives is your righteous lifestyle. You see, being a Christian changes your life. So if you have correct doctrine but are living like a dog, it's proof of something. It's proof that you're not saved. But you know what the third test is that proves it? It goes back to what Jesus said in John 13. John writes, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because, because, because you know it. It gives you assurance because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That's the third test. Test number one, doctrine of Christ. Test number two, godly lifestyle. Test number three, love of the brethren. A lot of Christians have number one and number two, but boy, you'd wonder about that number three. Do they really love the brethren? Do they love each other the way that Jesus loved them? Jesus gave that command in John 13. That's to demonstrate that we belong to him. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And what is the proof of love? The proof of love is sacrifice. Proof of love is not banging your lips together and jabbering about it. The proof of love is not acting pious and holy. The proof of love is not quoting Bible verses. The proof of love is not going out and acting self-righteous. He tells you what the proof of love is here. Hereby we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The proof of love is sacrifice. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends, said Jesus, if you do whatsoever I command you. We have a very glib and shallow view of love in the American culture. It all centers around physical beauty and sex and what can you get off of somebody else how can you take advantage of somebody else? That's not God's view of love. Genuine love is sacrifice. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What did he give him to do? 
to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. The genuine proof of love is sacrifice. A pure and holy sacrifice. A sacrifice acceptable to God. The presentation of your body is a reasonable service. A holy, acceptable sacrifice. A transformation of your mind. A love of the brethren. So John is talking about here. He gives some practical illustrations, but whoso has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shutteth his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Don't just bang your gums together. Talk about it. But in deed and in truth. He says the same thing over in 1 John chapter 4. Verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. It's not a matter of talking about it. It's a matter of doing it. He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. It is the automatic proof that you love God when you love your brethren. How the church has missed that over the centuries. How we miss it even today. That brought us to lesson number nine out of our text, which is when you're in the center of God's will, you can expect his protection even through the agency of human government for the purpose of accomplishing his final will. As I said a moment ago, we usually don't seem to like our governments, but government, even bad governments, are ordained by God according to Romans chapter 13. When it's time to go to heaven, and our government may kill us. Many governments around the world have killed Christians. Happening today, where believers are having their heads cut off by ISIS, and where they're being thrown into jail in communist countries like China, where they're being massacred in Saudi Arabia, and other places around the globe. I just put up yesterday... You probably haven't seen it yet, but on your way out, as you go out the hall here, there's the missionary bulletin board, then there's the pastor's bulletin board, but this chart was so big I couldn't get it on the pastor's board. So as you go around the corner, right above the bread table, it lists for you all of the Islamic terrorist groups that are currently killing Christians, and it gives you their names, and it shows you their locations on a map of the world, which is about this wide, full-size map, on the table above where you pick up the bread. Stop after the service and look at it tonight. There are some governments that are not protecting Christians. There are some governments that are actively seeking to kill Christians. When it comes time to go to heaven, there's nothing you or me or anyone else can do about it. You or I. God will take you and We'll be glad to go when the time comes. And then Paul demonstrates that principle of being subject to the government, both in our text, but he expounds on it theologically in Romans chapter 13. Here Paul is answering very rationally and very, you know, articulately to the commander. As Paul was led to the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee, who said, can you speak Greek? Are you not that Egyptian which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers? <laughs> I mean, the captain has no idea why in the world are the people yelling and screaming. And it says they were casting dust in the air, throwing their clothes in the air. They were throwing rocks at him. I mean, they, they were going to kill Paul. He said, man, this guy must, must really be one of these really, really bad guys. But Paul answers very calmly, very quietly says, no, I'm a Jew. And as a matter of fact, I'm a, a citizen of no mean city. And I came here to pay my vows and give my offerings to my people here in this temple. When you're falsely accused, respond quietly. Respond articulately. This is lesson number 10. Respond without panic. And remember, in all situations... God is still in control. We tend to forget that. 
I've told you before that when Judy and I first got married, I established what I called rule number one. We had a bunch of different rules. I've not told you the other rules, but I've told you rule number one. Rule number one is don't panic. <laughs> it is so easy to panic. Have you ever panicked in your life? Things have started to fall apart and suddenly you begin to get all agitated and all jittery and you make all kinds of dumb decisions. Have you ever panicked? I have. When you understand that God is in control and when you really believe it, you never have to panic. You can respond as Paul did. He's falsely accused. He's in the process of being murdered. But he responded quietly, articulately. He responded without panic. He gave the facts. He did not give opinion. He did not give emotion. So many of us respond with an emotional outburst. Paul said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Paul took advantage of the very opportunity where you and I would have thought, get me into the castle and away from these crazy people. But Paul thought, man, this is the best pulpit I've ever had. Look, I'm way high above all these people. I can see all of them, and this is a great place to talk from. I think that probably would not have been going through each of our minds at that moment, surrounded by a bunch of really tough, ugly-looking, bad-smelling soldiers, looking down on a group of people that are all screaming hatred at me. I think, man, I want out of here. Paul said, God's in control. Look at the pulpit he gave me. <laughs> Get God's perspective. It will enable you to handle any situation that you're faced with. Paul demonstrated that principle here in Acts 21, but he expounds on it theologically in 1 Thessalonians 4. He had a quietness of spirit. He had the ability to respond with what God had called him to do. And so he explains that in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, that you study to be quiet, to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Paul was going about doing his own business, and when things fell apart, he went about quietly, he responded properly, and he did the business that God called him to do, which was proclaim the gospel of Christ. We reach that calm equilibrium by prayer and absolute faith in the sovereignty of God. Paul tells Timothy to do that in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For all men? Yeah. Paul even prayed for his persecutors. But he goes on, verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority. Why? You see, if you have prayer in your life, it establishes a calm equilibrium. If you have faith in your life, it enables you to move forward in the times of distress. And that's what Paul explains in verse 2. For kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. You want to do something that God accepts? Pray for those in authority over you. That's good. That's acceptable. Do you pray for our president every day? You pray for his family life. Because you know a man's family life can, can really frustrate him and make him make all kinds of weird decisions in other realms. You pray for our vice president. You pray for our senators and representatives. Not merely Congress in general. You pray for their families. They're making decisions on a daily basis that will affect you for years to come. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Did you notice that last phrase? It occurs in another place, and I had hoped to get to this during the Christmas season, but that, that phrase, God our Savior, that occurs in the Christmas narrative. God, our Savior, is in control. God, our Savior. That was the response of the gentle, of the gentle teenage virgin Mary at the greatest crisis situation in her young life. 
No one else in the entire history of the world had ever faced the crisis situation that Mary faced. And yet she faced it with unwavering childlike faith because God was her Savior. As with the accusations against Paul, she would have accusations and scorn against her. Here's a pregnant, unwed mother. Even Joseph considered divorcing her privately and would have done so except for divine intervention. Jesus had that scorn heaped on him in John chapter 8 when the scribes and Pharisees sneeringly said to him, We were not born of fornication. God is our father. In other words, we've heard the rumors about Joseph and Mary before they had their wedding date. We were not born of fornication. Thirty years after the virgin conception and virgin birth, That gentle, young teenager, Mary, responded with faith, childlike, unwavering faith, because God was her Savior. She was able to face the crisis because she had absolute confidence in that. Do you remember the Magnificat? And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. That's the same phrase that Paul writes to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Well, our time is up, and I didn't quite get to resume and revolution. So next week, having finished now Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and Murder, Part 3, the Lord willing, we'll start with resume and revolution next Sunday. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. You're a wonderful and gracious God. You are a sovereign God. Nothing is too hard for you. Each one of us will face crisis situations in our life, and the question is, how will we face them? Will we face them with the same calmness, with the same divine viewpoint, the same tenacity that the Apostle Paul did, where he looked at his situation, which was total chaos, and saw in it divine opportunity. Father, we pray that you would teach us to learn the practical lessons, not merely the interesting narrative, but the practical lessons of life by the way in which we see a man who is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit responding to the world around him fulfilling obligations, doing your will regardless of the cost, understanding that the consequences of doing right would result in persecution, and yet doing it anyway, not caring what other people thought, but only caring what you thought because you are the God to whom someday we must each give an account. Father, again, we thank you for your word and for its power, and we pray for your blessings on it and your application to each of our hearts. You know each of our lives. You know the things that are in our lives that have to be dealt with. And so we pray that you'll take your word as it has gone forth tonight, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.